Hi folks, I'm Woody and welcome back to the shed for part three of making the most of the mini sport. In part one, we looked at the camera equipment available to the air-to-air -air photographer in a single seat airplane. And in part two, we covered some options for mounting them on and in the aircraft. Now, in part three, we'll look at using action cameras for stills photography, how to get decent still images from shaky footage, and finally, a quick look at sound recording. I'm assuming that you have a camera that hasn't cost much, so we'll have the basic functions, but little more than that. Please don't take my word for it, though. Go through the camera's manual and see what you can get, because specs are improving all the time. You might be lucky and be able to ignore some of the suggestions that I'm about to offer. You might remember a comment I made in part one about action cams being less than ideal for filming moving subjects, which seems a bit of a limitation for something with action in the name. I said that because, and you might also remember this bit, since the camera is recording little bits of the image in a top to bottom fashion, if the scene itself or something obvious within it is moving, then we get that jello effect. This isn't so obvious if it's us that's doing the moving and the subject is still. This is the usual situation when we put the camera on a helmet and set off on a bike or skis to film our daring adventures. We, that is the camera, does the moving and the scenery stays still. Most of the time, anyway. The problem comes when both the camera and the subject move, like in this video. The camera is suffering vib from vibrations of various kinds and the details of the subject are moving across the lens. So we get a combination of camera shake and jello which isn't good. We've seen how we can get rid of the jello by using an ND filter, but I don't know of any cameras at the cheaper end of the market that will allow us to do this. Not because we can't fit one, a bit of gaffer tape would sort that fairly easily, but because there's no means of controlling the shutter speed. We're stuck with whatever the camera decides to use, and because of the nature of the beast, the shutter speed will be fast to reduce blurring and the effects of any camera shake, as high as one four thousandth of a second in the case of the camera that I pictured here. Considering the aperture is fixed at a wide open level, about f1.8 or thereabouts if you want to get technical about it, and that also gives us a focal length of infinity. In other words, just about everything in front of the camera's lens, including your fingers, will be in focus. One of the downsides of this arrangement is that everything looks miles away, but we talked about that before. If you paid a little more for your gadget, you might have the benefit of choosing a more forgiving shutter speed and also image stabilisation, which will help to reduce the effects of camera movement. But we're concentrating on the basic, cheaper type of cameras here, which don't have those features. Now, if we want good cinematic video, then we actually want a bit of blurring to show natural motion. It looks nice. We don't want jittery video, though. If we can let the subject do the moving, the motion blur will happen if the shutter speed's slow enough, which, unfortunately, isn't how an entry-level action camera is designed to be used. On this basis, you might be wondering why we bother with cheap cameras in the first place, but we can make use of these apparent limitations if we use the video footage as a source of still images. The fast shutter speed and wide open aperture that gives us those jittery non-motion blur videos with everything in sharp focus can be an advantage for capturing still images. If your camera is a time-lapse photo mode, then this is probably the best option for a dedicated still photo session, since it makes the editing easier. But often the photo resolution isn't to the same standard as the video. Think 12 megapixels or so, which is pretty average for 2023, and the time interval will be quite long. Two seconds is typically the shortest interval we can select, and an aircraft in close formation can be out of frame in that time. If, like me, you prefer to shoot video for other reasons, then we need to use a different strategy to get our still images. How do we do that, then? Unfortunately, we're going to need a computer and some basic editing software to do this easily, but most of us are in that position nowadays, so I'll assume that you can load your video from the camera's SD card into something like Windows Video Editor, or perhaps something a little more sophisticated, which would allow us to step through our footage more easily. None of these apps are particularly expensive to get the functions we need for this, and you've probably got a basic app preloaded anyway when you bought your computer. <laughs> 
I'm assuming a desktop here, or maybe a laptop if it's reasonably high spec. If you're editing on a smartphone, well, yeah, it can be done, but it isn't a lot of fun, and fun is what this is all about. With the footage in the viewer or editor, we're able to pause the playback at any point of our choosing to get a still image. Most editors will allow us to step through the video frame by frame, but this isn't critical, just more convenient. What we're trying to do now is to pause the video at a frame that's sharp, properly exposed, has a subject in focus and an appropriate place in the frame. Because of all the limitations we know about, this isn't often very easy, but at some point after a lot of shuttling backwards and forwards, we'll find a frame or two that are acceptable which we can grab and maybe load into a photo editing app to give it a bit of a tweak. The quality of the end product is really down to how much time we're prepared to devote to the job, but we can help ourselves a lot by taking some control over the raw material. By that I mean the shooting conditions and the camera settings, such as we have any control over. So we must know how to use the camera, set it up prior to flight, and don't bother trying to shoot on dull days. The camera will be using a high shutter speed to record blur-free images, so this will let less light through than we need for a bright picture on a dark day. The images will look a bit like the sky did at the time, grey and uninteresting in terms of colour. If we have to though, the camera will have a menu that will allow some adjustment of the shooting parameters. I'm looking for the means of adjusting ISO and EV. Well, what are they then? Well, we've set the ISO to 100, or the lowest available setting in the menu, as we discussed before. We could use a higher ISO, your camera might offer numbers as high as 6400, and this will allow us to get brighter images, but at the cost of image quality. If you leave the camera set to auto, this is what we'll it'll do on the fly, and the result might be disappointingly grainy as we see here. One way, of getting, one way of getting some control over what the camera does in auto is to play around with the exposure value or EV setting. This is normally set to zero, but if we set say plus one, then the camera will try to use a slower shutter speed without automatically reaching for a higher ISO. Personally, I try not to bother, but if I'm forced to, I'll set an ISO of 100 and play around with the EV setting to get an acceptable image on the ground, since most of the time the camera can't be reached in the air. Even if it's in the cockpit, trying to juggle with these settings and fly at the same time is something I find a bit of a challenge. Now we're on the subject of stills photography, this can be a really re rewarding aspect of flying for fun. Pointing the camera at the ground or another aeroplane can be a bit of a lottery in terms of the results since we often can't see what the camera is seeing. I would say that's probably most of the time. So this needs a bit of forward planning if we have some specific target in mind. For the moment we'll concentrate on photographing the landscape or details of it, buildings and the like. The camera's field of view is wide, so unless you're completely inept, you'll be able to fly over or past your chosen subject well enough to capture at least some of it in the frame, and this gets easier the further away we are. But, and that word again, if you overdo it, then the subject's going to disappear into the weeds, so experiment will pay off here to obtain, obtain an acceptable height or distance against field of view compromise. Too low or close, and even the best pilot and camera will have difficulty getting a perfect shot because of the ground rushing by at amazing speed. We have a basic choice of view, vertical, straight down, or oblique, which is sideways or almost so. Obviously, we like to be fairly close for detailed subjects like houses, but here we go again, there are limits, 500 feet in my case and no closer. Quite apart from the law, there's good reasons not to go lower than this, because a small error in what we think the camera sees, or the track we achieve, will mean we'd be doing it all over again. Another excuse to have to go flying, what a pity. But anyway, the idea is to be successful at this and have some fun while we're doing it. Given the limitations of the action camera, how close can I fly to the target? Can I legally overfly at 500 feet? If I have permission from the subjects to go lower, what about the neighbours? Are there any physical constraints to overflight? Tall trees, power lines, masts? Where would the light be coming from? Would there be any unacceptable shadows from those tall trees we noted? Can we shoot down sun and get the image we want? Is there a best time of day or track to optimise those what-ifs? Do we want a photo looking straight down, avert, or looking sideways and oblique? If the former, have we a ground feature picked out to aim at to ensure a perfect overhead track? Bearing in mind we won't actually see the target from about, well, what, I suppose 10 seconds out? Because it's going to be hidden underneath the nose. 
For a vert, we need obviously to fly over the target. But this is best done on the track we know is best for the conditions, at the right height, at the right speed to reduce vibrations, and with the ball in the middle. In other words, accurate, balanced, coordinated flying. Are we doing an oblique? Have we done the arithmetic and geometry to fly the correct track and height for the camera angle? If it's windy, what would be our drift angle? Can we adjust this if things aren't as forecast? And when are they ever as forecast? A lot to think about even before we get in the aeroplane. In the days before GPS and computers, this had to be done using Siemens Eye and Kentucky windage. Good recce pilots knew which rivets to line up along the wing to get the angle they needed or drew wax pencil lines on the canopy and flew with a lot of wing down and top rudder. For an oblique shot, I know where to put the subject relative to my wingtip, so if I fly towards the target on the ideal offset track, I aim to let it hit my leading edge about halfway along. If I then drop the wing, I can use rudder to point the wingtip or cockpit camera, which is in line with my eye, at the subject and hold it there with top rudder to keep it there for as long as I can. If I'm quite low, that won't be for very long. Here we see the results from two cameras. One on the wingtip and the other on the cockpit crane mount. Sometimes this just won't work, particularly with vert since we can't see the target underneath us so we have to get a map out and, horror of horrors, draw a line and measure it. When was the last time we did that then, Ace? If you come back and join me for part four, we can take a closer look at this skill. But for now, just think about how you fly a precise track using your GPS, or not. The external cameras will be shooting video since these basic cameras don't give us the ability to shoot good quality stills, that is photographic images, continuously. However, if we can use a shutter button, then the option is available. Also, because of a very wide angle lens, most of our subjects are going to look as if they are a very long distance away, unless we're taking selfies, which, let's face it, can get a bit boring after a while, not to mention making me look like a fish. This is where a basic compact camera comes into its own. As we saw in part two, try to get something with an optical zoom and some means of triggering the shutter remotely. Wi-Fi might work but is unreliable, so I prefer a cable release, or rather the electronic version of that. Here's my fairly flexible checklist that I go through in planning a shoot with this type of gear. Right, prior to flight, I disable the power save facility. If it kicks in, then some of the settings I've worked hard to create will be lost, the zoom setting for, ex for example. If I'm taking stills, I set the camera to use the shutter priority mode. Then I have the final say on the shutter speed so I can select something quite high, normally in excess of 1 500th of a second, or as fast as I can get away with when the light, in the lighting conditions that we have on the day. This will largely eliminate the effects of camera shake, and since we're not interested much in motion blur now, we have the luxury of an action stopping speed. All the lighting adjustments I feel like making based on what I see on the monitor screen are now made by varying the shutter opening time, which I can do easily by turning an adjustment ring on the lens. The camera is set to either burst mode, three frames at least, or continuous shooting. In close formation, a pair of us, or sometimes more, are constantly moving about. So a single photo might get an image, but the odds aren't good that I get an acceptable one, that is a steady, well-framed and well-lit result. A burst of three or more shots has a greater chance of success. If the lighting conditions are challenging, then setting the mode to bracket exposure will have the same effect as taking three shots, each at normal, plus one EV, and minus one EV. I, I, the, what I mean by that is a normal exposure, as you would expect, one slightly brighter, one slightly darker. This will give you three chances of getting a decently exposed image. I mount the camera on the crane mount and with the canopy closed, swing it into shooting position and switch it on. The lens group will then extend. If it touches the canopy at this stage, it will retract the lens and automatically switch the camera off, which isn't what we want to discover when in flight. So make sure there's enough room to, for small, but only small adjustments later. To eliminate as many reflections as possible, try to have the lens at no more than a 45 degree angle to the canopy. 
if you're anything like me, you probably won't notice the reflections on the canopy when you're actually doing the shoot. You won't see them until you get back to the computer later, and by then it's far too late and can be quite annoying. Once you're airborne, I set the camera up so I can see the monitor as clearly as I can, which can be tricky in strong sunlight. As a backup to this, I do a test frame of the subject with a light behind it so I don't get reflections off the monitor or canopy. Zooming is necessary to get that 50mm view, which we discussed in part 2. Once this is done, I make a mental note of where the subject is relative to the wingtip. This generally works out to be just under 1 meter in the, basically the 1 o'clock position if I'm shooting left, that's as I see it. This is my formation echelon position, and to vary the size of the image, all I need to do is to fly up and down that line as necessary without touching the camera at all. With that as my datum, I don't have to concentrate on the monitor when I'm in close formation either, just getting in my peripheral vision is enough. Basically, I'm doing my shooting using that spot on the windscreen which I'm imagining. The odds of getting good pictures are better if I shoot a lot of frames, which is where the remote release pays off. I can press and hold the button for as long as I can keep the subject in the frame and stand a good chance of getting something usable as a result. The cable is long enough that I can hold the release between finger and thumb and still have three fingers left to work the noise lever. As I mentioned in part two, you'll have to experiment with power settings and airspeeds to find a sweet spot where vibrations are at an acceptable level. This will mean briefing your subject if it's another aeroplane, so you aren't having to exceed these limits, and with vastly different aircraft performance this can be really tricky. You might be able to tell that during this shoot Lima Whiskey is flying the brief 75 knots for my benefit and is quite happy, but Oscar Zulu most certainly isn't. Happy that is. Look at the flap setting he's had to use to stay in position. Given that he's clearly working hard, I sat at a safe distance and compensated with more zoom, which isn't ideal but works if there's no safe alternative. If all else fails and you still get the shakes, you might find that you can use your arm or hand to brace the mounting. I can just about manage this without risking any loss of control. If I'm taking shots of the ground though, I try to do this with a low power setting and fly left-handed so I can use my right hand to brace the camera. Obviously, this isn't recommended in close formation. So why did we do it? Because it's challenging, improves handling skills and develops a lot of trust between us, which pays off in other ways. And it's great fun. So, assuming that we've done the best part, we're now at the desk and staring at what we've managed to capture with our battery of optical gadgets. I use an app called Power Director, which allows me to step through my footage frame by frame. It can be done using the Windows preloaded apps, but it just takes a bit longer and isn't as precise when working through the frames. The aim now is to select an image that ticks as many boxes as possible on the checklist. The first thing I might look for is a sharp image that isn't overexposed. With this as a baseline, my image editors, I use Affinity and Luminar, can often take care of the exposure errors, assuming they aren't too gross. Cropping will help with reframing, and if the image is sharp enough to begin with, I might be able to enlarge it a little if I want to. All of these tweaks rely on a good base image, so it's worth doing that early setup stuff every time. Low ISO, fast shutter, exposure value, lots of images, etc. So we have that base to work from. Finally, I'll often play around with effects from the apps to give the image a bit of a creative shove. I don't like to do, go too far with this because basically it's cheating, but sometimes it really helps if I want to tell a story or emphasise something. Or we'll just add a bit of drama. And finally, let's look at generating some noise. <laughs> the audio quality of most camera mics is generally terrible. Useless for capturing casual chatter, even if you don't want broadcast quality sound. Unfortunately, just the effect of a breath of wind can drown out everything else, so to get good audio needs an alternative sound recorder. Remember, we're talking entry-level cameras here still. More expensive cameras, though, allow us to connect them, and we'll look at how to use those in a minute. I generally have the audio selected on in the camera menu, though, because engine noise is about all I need for most of my productions, and even the good mic won't have much of an advantage here. The awful audio quality from the camera is adequate for this, but I can always dub in some generic engine noise if necessary. Where I can make use of an external microphone input is for recording radio chatter, 
This has been an experiment which initially didn't work, but by changing the camera, which I use as a recorder, and using different patch leads connected into the helmet mic and earphones, I've achieved some reasonable results. Some cameras react better to this than others, so some trial and error is needed to get the best results from the gear that you have. This was the result I managed to achieve. Dropping this into an audio editor improves it a little so it can be quite useful for reconstructing interesting events, like my arrival at a fly-in last year which caused some frantic moments during the landing. All four of them. Landings, that is. Actually, it was only one frantic moment, but it lasted a long time, I thought. See if you can spot the problem. The first comment that gets it right has an honourable mention in part four. Hello, Radio Golf Tango India Victor Victor. Golf Tango India Victor Victor, Orlando Radio. Very good afternoon to you. We're using Robbie 25 on the left hand, QNH 1022. QNH 1022, I have uh, four miles to run from the north, and I'll join in the standard overhead for runway 25. So, that's part three complete. I hope it's been of interest and will give you some ideas to make the most of your mini sport or anything else that you can get into that has wings. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it, and perhaps we'll meet again in part four, where we'll look at some old school skills that aren't better than navigation by smartphone, just more rewarding and much more fun. Bye for now. <laughs>